Good day, folks. So good to be here with you once again. Uh, as we're getting closer and closer to the end of October. And we want to continue today with our sermon series, A Living Hope, a verse-by-verse study of 1 Peter. We're getting close to the end, maybe two, three more sermons, and we will be done. So uh, it's been a while, and I appreciate your patience, and I thank you for inviting me in your places. So uh, I, have, I have something I'd like to share with you. A question. Have, have you heard someone lately say this to you? Not now, I'm busy. Or maybe you've said that. Or maybe someone described their lives in this way. I'm too busy, I, don't, I have no time to worry. And maybe some are so busy they said this, I'm so busy, I don't know if I found a rope or lost a horse. That's a pretty busy life. See, even in our culture, when we think of our Western culture, a busy life is often seen as a positive thing. Someone might say, happiness is being busy doing the things that I love. Or never apologize for the hustle. Now, Colin Noble in his article that he called Better Than Busy, Recovering Rest in a Burnout Culture, writes this, quote, the cry of our age is busy. And I did, indeed, we can probably agree with Colin in our modern life, our 21st century life, the days are busy, work is busy, the kids are busy, it's drive them here, drive them there, taxi driver, mom. And so many of us live our lives constantly on the go in so many different ways. We live this fast-paced life that often can push uh, God over to the side, if you will. At the end of the day, we just are simply exhausted in every which way. This expectation to keep up with uh, everything grows larger and more demanding when you consider uh, the social media of our day the Facebooks, the Instagrams, and all these other apps and availabilities on our phones. And Colin describes this growing trend as, quote, always available, aware of everything that is happening, and capable of of achieving anything. Friends, this pressure to be everywhere at once, know all things, be all-powerful, along with uh, some very bad habits like Lack of sleep or poor diets, you know them, french fries at McDonald's and a couch potato lifestyle. Colin would add all these things there in his article and this often leads just to an increased life of anxiety and restlessness. And he writes, quote, the futile attempts to sustain ourselves by our own efforts is not new. Our digital age simply offers new manifestations of the age-old temptation to usurp God's role for ourselves, end quote. And Colin goes on in his article to try to be helpful to his readers by pointing them to some of the ways he thinks we could recover rest, uh, to recover a desire for God, to trust God and return Christ to his rightful place in our lives. But we're not going there. Uh, because I think we need to ask some more questions. We need to drill down a little deeper in maybe a more personal way. So consider this. In our fast-paced lives, how concerned are we as believers about keeping our minds ready or agile, if you will, and focused for God's purposes? What if, what if anything is keeping us or everything, maybe, is keeping us from thinking clearly and maybe even stopping us or uh, delaying us from praying faithfully. How important is, is being a good steward of God's varied gifts to us? How does running from here and there and back and the lack of sleep and eating at McDonald's more often than we should, spending money that we don't have for things that we don't need, Help us use God's good gifts for his purposes. How does an anxious and restless life help us love one another? How can we love others and be the hospitable people God calls us to be And when we try to be, as Colin put so well, quote, always available, aware of everything that is happening, and capable of achieving everything? 
Well, as we consider these things, let's turn now to our Bibles, to 1 Peter chapter 4, as we continue in our, our study here. Today we'll be reading from verse 1 through 11 for context. Starting at verse 1, chapter 4. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Verse 4, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel is preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Verse 7. The end of all things is at hand, therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received the gift, use it to serve one another, as good stewards of God's varied grace. Verse 11, whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you, Lord that in even this day has been a long one for, for myself. In preparation, I thank you for the strength that I have from your spirit to continue and finish and accomplish what I started out to do today. And I pray for those who are listening. I pray wherever they are and whatever is happening in their life, that they would know the love of God, which surpasses everything that comes in our way or comes our way, Lord. Help us, Lord, to understand what you're asking us of today. Help us not only to remember and to acknowledge it, but actually to put it into practice. And we pray these things for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. So, dear friends, the focus today, our attention will be spent on verse 7 to 11, those five verses. The Apostle Peter would continue here in his summation of all that he had said from chapter 1 to 3. And that theme of suffering that we've talked about so often from one's faith in Christ is front and center here as well in his mind. Always, always, Peter pointing his first century audience back to Christ, back to the reason for their suffering, as he said to them in chapter 2, uh, verse 21, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you might follow in his steps. The apostle, concerned to keep Christ's purpose uh, for his death and resurrection always before his audience. The apostle doing what he could to boost the unity of the believers that were facing a variety of trials from a variety of sources. Always, always bringing his audience back to Christ. Always reminding them of their great salvation, that their hope was a living hope, that Christ was their example to follow in the good times, the bad times, and in the ugly times of their lives. And now as we look at our text, the apostle adds another element, if you will. Take a look at verse 7a, that first half of that verse. Peter said, the end of all things is at hand. We must remember the apostle's motivation was to encourage and instruct his first century audience enduring persecution for their faith. And here he brings in another perspective, if you will, a perspective that was both encouraging and also a warning. So what did the apostle Peter mean uh, that the end of all things is at hand? Well, friends, this kind of language is also used by the apostle Paul. And we go to his Roman letter where he said to the church in Rome that their salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. There's that language. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Romans chapter 13, verse 12 and 13. 
Hear the Apostle Paul in that chapter uh, using similar language as the Apostle Peter. When we look at this phrase, is at hand, it literally means has come near. So both the Apostle Peter and Paul using language pointing to the second coming of Christ. The writer to Hebrews puts it this way. The day, capital D, drawing near. Hebrews 10.25, the day drawing near. We, all, we remember uh, the apostles through the Gospels that they expected that Jesus would take out the Romans by force. That's why Jesus was uh, there. They had expected the Messiah would come and he would kick out their Roman oppressors. Well, we know from the Gospel accounts that Jesus made it very clear this was not going to happen. And he settled this once for all when he was before Pontius Pilate uh, after he was arrested. There he was before this governor of uh, Judea in chains. And he said to him, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. He repeats himself twice there. Just in John chapter 18, verse 36. And we know that after the death and resurrection, the ascension of Jesus Christ, that the early church, we, we know this from, from reading the Gospels. We know this from reading uh, the letters. We know this from church history. They had anticipated that Jesus would return in their time. Yet Jesus, even before he departed and uh, was ascended to heaven, reminded or clarified to his disciples, his apostles, that no one apart from God knew the exact time of his second coming, his return. He said to them, we, we find this in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 36. He said to them as he was preparing them for his departure, but concerning the day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. And Jesus did everything he could to prepare his disciples to be ready for the second coming. He reminded them that his re return would be like the days of Noah. People then in Noah's day were eating and drinking and getting married right up until Noah and his family went into the ark. They were unaware until the water started surrounding them. And Jesus said this would be the same when he uh, returns. He, he reminds them, he, he warns them actually, therefore stay awake for you do not know on the, what day your Lord is coming. Matthew 24, 42. So back to the question, what did the Apostle Peter mean when he said the end of all things is at hand? Here in verse 7a. Simply this, that the end of all things is drawing near. It draws near. Because all had been prepared and ready for history to come to an end by this time. God's promised Messiah had come. He had lived his life. He died. He was resurrected and ascended. And that has been completed. Jesus was ready now and is ready now to judge the living and all those who have ever lived. The Apostle Peter in his letter reminded his audience that they were living in those last days. And 2,000 years, my friends, has come and gone since the Apostle Peter wrote this letter. And by God's grace, the day of Jesus' return continues to draw ever nearer. Well, do you remember the question? Remember this question? How concerned are we about keeping our minds ready or agile and focused for God's purposes? As the, draw, as the day draws near, are we busy for busy's sake? What should our response be to Jesus, who said to stay awake and be prepared, to stay alert as the end of all things draws nearer? As we seek to answer these questions, we need to keep the context of Peter's letter in mind. Always the context. Until Jesus returns, believers, until Jesus returns, believers may suffer trials uh, for their faith in Christ. And when trials do come, a believer's way for their faith in Christ. In these last days, the Apostle Peter here in verse 7b reminds them, Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Here we have two verbs in this particular phrase. We have self-controlled and sober-minded. And both these verbs are in the active voice and in the imperative mood. 
the Apostle Peter here expressing a command to his audience to perform a certain action by the authority given to him as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Jesus, we go to Mark's gospel, we find Jesus there. As he began to go about Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, he said this, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. You see, when Jesus said, repent and believe in the gospel, he was not giving an invitation, as we often do uh, in popular evangelicalism. We give an invitation to repent and believe. Jesus here is not giving a repent and believe in the gospel as an invitation, but he's giving it as an absolute command, requiring full obedience on the part of those who would have heard this. And this is how we should interpret these two verbs that we find here in verse 7b. We should interpret them as a command that you and I have been given by God via his appointed and anointed apostle Peter through the inspired word of God. So let's go back to our text and let's look at this one particular verb called translated by the ESV that I am using, self-controlled. The original, meaning, the original meaning carries the sense of, uh, to think and live wisely in self-control over one's passions and desires. Now, Greek scholar and Greek teacher Bill Mounts translates the original Greek as sound judgment, vice self-controlled. Now, the NSAB 1995 edition uses the same translation as Mounts. And this is in keeping with what the Apostle had already said earlier in his letter. If we look at that, chapter 1, verse 13, with this in mind, there Peter said, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being of sound judgment, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Next, we have the verb here translated by the ESV, sober-minded. This is another imperative. Another command by the Apostle Peter to his audience. Literally, we could just say, sober up. So there is this sense that this means to be free from, say, the influence of alcohol. Of course, this doesn't fit the context here in Peter's letter. So here's the point. We need to remember that when we talk about believers suffering persecution for their faith in Christ, in in this first century context, for example, it's one thing to talk about it, but it's a whole other thing to experience persecution. You know, we, we, we should never consider applying that, that uh, child's idiom that many of us learned years ago. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That idea, we should never apply it to these first century believers. And even those today who are persecuted for their faith in Christ. See, when they suffered for their faith in Christ, they really suffer something. Some, from being, uh, some were being thrown out into the street by their families, disowned, and even killed maybe by their families. Some had their homes and their lands and their livelihood taken away. They were reduced to begging in the streets. Some were being put on a pole covered with pitch and put on fire to illuminate Nero's Roman streets. See, friends, when believers suffer for their faith in Christ, they really suffer. It's hard, it's bad, and it's sad. Well, the Apostle Peter, knowing there was a good chance that they could be divided in their suffering, and maybe even some would recant and turn from Christ and turn back to their former lives. The question is, what could they do? What would they do? What would you do? Here in these first five verses, these five verses that we have here, verse 7 to 11, the apostle exhorted his audience to prepare themselves to think and live wisely according to their times. That would be good advice for us today as well. To have sound judgment and to be well balanced in a response to the trials and tribulations of life. Look to Christ to see how he responded to his persecutors. Remember what Peter said, he did not revile when he was reviled. He did not insult when he was insult, insulted. To remember that their, their great salvation and, their, and the inheritance that was waiting for, for waiting for them on the day that Jesus would return. To remember that their gift of faith was because Jesus died for their sins. 
that he rose again and now sits at the right hand of God with all power and all glory. That they were God's people and they would always be his people. Nothing, not even death, could take God's everlasting life and everlasting light, love from them. They were his people and God their good father forever, forever. So today, have some sound judgment. That's what he's saying here. So you will do what God's people do in the good times, the bad times, and even the ugly times. You will pray, you will love, you will be welcoming, and you will serve. This was the response that these New Testament writers were teaching their audiences to follow and to do in their time. And we'd be smart, actually wise is the better word, to follow it as well. So let's take a look then at the, the first response the Apostle has here in verse 7. The Apostle said here in verse 7, Therefore be of sound judgment and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Pastor and theologian John Stott said a prayer, quote, prayer is the very way God himself has chosen for us to express our conscious need of him and our humble dependence on him. The reformer John Calvin so long ago said this a prayer, quote, the best remedy to the weariness is diligence in prayer. Apostle Paul, uh, there was a time he was in a Roman prison and with the help of his dear friend Timothy, he sent a letter to the church at Philippi. And 11 times in that letter, while Paul was in prison, he encouraged the Philippians to rejoice, to be full of joy. And as the letter drew to a close, he said this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Then he went on to say, The Lord is at hand. There's that language that we have here in Peter's letter. Rejoice. In the Lord always, again I say rejoice, the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 to 6. This begs a question, or the question. Are you busy being busy? You know, you're chasing all those videos on Instagram or TikTok, Scrolling one after the other, checking out Facebook, whatever else you do there on social media. Maybe you're catching the 5 p.m., the 6 p.m., and the 10 p.m. news every day, all the time, everywhere. How's that working for you? It's kind of hard to rejoice in the Lord, right? Kind of hard to pray when you are anxious about everything, right? If you want the peace of God that surpasses all understanding... It's yours for the praying. It's yours for the praying, my friends. So first response, pray, and then pray some more. Then the Apostle Peter went on to say, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since it covers a multitude of sins. That's verse 8. Now this was the second time that he said this, that he commanded his, the believers, his audience, to keep loving one another earnestly. That was back in chapter 1, verse 22. Just take a look at this word, earnestly. The NIV translate this as, translates this as deeply. It can also be translated as fervently or fervent. Now, the original Greek word used here was used to describe the muscle of an athlete straining to win a race. So if you ever worked out in a gym, you know, you strain your muscle, you know, when you're lifting weights or you're, you're doing your biceps or, or your legs, you're straining those muscles. But this was uh, first century. The idea was the muscles of an athlete straining to win a race. So with this in mind, the follower of Christ, above all, in other words, of first importance, the follower of Christ makes demonstrating the love of Jesus to others their first priority, especially when suffering for Christ. And believers loving each other and others is always the correct response, knowing that the end of all things is drawing close. And this loving earnestly, Peter said, also covers a multitude of sins. He adds that on this verse. And you might be going, wait, pastor, wait, wait, hold the bus, Gus. Do you mean that our acts of love can earn us forgiveness from, for our sins from God? Short answer, no, no, and no. So let's keep this rather simple. 
The idea here is that love covers a multitude of sin, refers to our human imperfections. You see, we are not sin- sinless. You are not sinless. First century uh, believers were not sinless. None of us are perfect. None of them were perfect. Yet as believers keep their lives away from sin, as we, we go in the opposite direction toward holiness, and even when they fail at those times, our love for others includes our forgiving others as well for hurting us. It's not holding grudges. It's not holding hatred in our hearts for those who hurt us. As the Apostle Paul said so very well, love bears all things. 1 Corinthians 13, 7. So I need to ask another question. How are you doing with loving others? Are you holding on to a grudge? Are you holding on to unforgiveness? Apostle Peter is very clear here. Love covers over a multitude of sins. So first response, prayer. Second response, love. Next, Peter said this, verse 9. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Here's the apostles' practical way for the first century believers to, to show the love of Jesus to others by offering them hospitality without grumbling. We go to the author of the letter to the Hebrews who said this, Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Then he went on to say, remember those in prison and remember those who are mistreated. Hebrews chapter 13, 1 to 3. So when you think of hospitality, what comes to your mind? Is it having a friend over to play a card game? Is it or to watch a hockey game or a football game? Having some friends over for supper? What do you think about hospitality when it comes to your mind? But our first century brothers and sisters, this was a different thing. They were facing various trials and they had a great need for hospitality. Some might have been fleeing persecution, others traveling with bare essentials. And they relied on other believers to share a place to sleep and uh, basic needs such as food. We see Jesus when uh, he was doing his gospel ministry as well for those three years, go from place to place. He would stay with others. Uh, because he needed a place to stay. And then when you think about hospitality in the first century, it came with its own risks. Because the question is, what if strangers lied about being a Christian and they came in maybe to harm or to steal? And yet, who said Christians had to steal sometimes, even back then? But notice that the apostle doesn't mention these possible realities. He's focusing here on the hospitality, and that's how the family of God shows they love each other. They are hospitable towards each other and toward others. So I have to ask again, how busy are you and I as Christians? You know, there was this story of the pastor. I'm making it up, by the way. It's just a pretend story. The pastor asked in church on Sunday if someone could provide a meal and a a place to sleep for a night or two for a Uh, down and out believer, and nobody responded. So the question is, how busy are we as Christians when there's a need and we can meet it? So first response, prayer. Second response, love. Third response, hospitality. And finally, Peter said, here in verse 10, as each has received the gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Now the NIV translates the original language here in this way as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. A couple of things here happening we can just look at very quickly to be aware of. We're coming to the end here, folks. First apostle here reminded his audience of the Christian worldview. That's what he's talking about here. A worldview that was very different from their culture as it is even in our culture. Because, friends, those things that believers call their own are not their own. All believers, all their time, their talents and treasures are gifts from God. Even the spiritual gifts God gives us to use for the edification of the church and the furtherance of his kingdom are from God. James put it very well. He said in his letter, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. That's in James chapter 1, verse 17. So first of all, we have 
All we have belongs to God and is from God. Secondly, Peter goes on to say here, serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Verse 10. Now there's a place as we could go in the Gospels. The parable of the talents. Very good place to go. We're not going there. I would ask you to look at that, what Jesus said about gifts uh, that God gives us and how we're to use them. But I digress. In the first century, a steward was someone given the trust and responsibility to manage someone else's property. And I think the point is made well here by Peter. God has given believers gifts to be used for his purposes and will. And one of those purposes is right here in this letter in our text is to serve others. To serve others. So the first response is prayer. Second response is love. Third response is hospitality. Fourth response, serve one another. And we do this whether it's a good day or whether it's a bad day, whether it's a day that we're suffering for our faith in Christ. We are to be mindful of these things because God put us together as a family, a family that cares for each other and loves each other and prays for each other and serves for each other. May we be ever mindful of that. But the big question is why? Why pray? Why love? Why be hospitable? And why serve others? Well, Peter gives us the answer right here in verse 11. Verse 11. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this message. Thank you, Lord, for the gifts that you have given us. Uh, help us, Lord, to hold on to those things lightly. I know, Lord, that you also want us to be cared for. You provide everything that we need. We know Jesus even said that in the Sermon on the Mount, that we are to pursue you and your righteousness and everything else will be added. So I pray for my friends, whatever place they are, whether they're in deep need or they're on in abundance, I pray, God, on all those levels, wherever it is and in between, that they would know that you love them, that you love them and you care for them, and that you have a purpose for them. You have a purpose for them to pray, to love, to be hospitable, and to serve others. And we pray and thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Shalom.